Now, you interviewed him outdoors. Why, Bill? Well, by that time, the secret police knew that I was filming. And I was under close surveillance, as uh, Bukowski is right now, or as he's been for uh, ever since last January, when he got out of his last stretch of prison. So we found a secluded wood outside Moscow, uh, screened in by, by brush, and uh, we filmed there. Let's go to the Moscow woods and Mr. Bukowski. What is life like for a dissident like yourself inside an insane asylum? Что представляет из себя Ленинградская специальная психиатрическая больница? Imagine to yourself a prison, an old prison, which was a prison even before the revolution, in which there's something like a thousand prisoners, more than half of them murderers, people who've uh, committed serious crimes at a time when they were out of their minds, people who are genuinely sick, and the remainder were political prisoners, dissidents, for whom no article could be found in the criminal code, whom they could find no other way of treating but in such a place. The fact is that the inmates, the, the patients in that hospital, the, the prisoners, are people who have done such things which from the point of view of the authorities are crimes, but which are not criminal from the point of view of the law. And in order in some way to isolate them, to punish them in some way, such people are declared to be insane and are detained as patients in these mental prison hospitals. Some time passed before I understood this and before I got to know with my uh, fellow prisoners. I believe this is the usual fate for a person who wishes to be himself, who, who, who wants to say what he thinks, uh, to act in accordance with his convictions and his ideas. Events of recent years confirm my supposition. Many people, tens, hundreds of people, have been declared insane and committed to various hospitals, mainly special ones, like those in Kazan, Leningrad, Chernigov, Sechovka, and so forth. It's uh, very much more difficult to get out of that place than it is to get into it. Firstly, in order to get out, you must declare openly and officially to the doctors that you admit that you are sick. Yes, I was, I'm ill, I, I didn't know what I was doing. And the second condition is to admit that you were wrong, to disavow what you did. I know several cases of people who refused to say that they had done wrong and spent many long years in the hospital. Nikolai Samsonov, for example, a geophysicist from Leningrad, who was kept there simply because he refused to admit he was a sick man. Another of my friends in, in the madhouse was, for example, a French communist of uh, Romanian origin, who had lived for more than 10 years in Marseille and who came to the Soviet Union to learn, to see what communism was like in practice. He went to work in a footwear factory in Moldavia and worked there for a long time. But he was displeased that the workers there received such low wages. He told his workmates that they ought to fight for better pay. They went on strike. He was arrested and declared insane. In the hospital, he just couldn't understand what had happened to him, how communists could do such things. For him, communism and the struggle for a better life were more or less the same thing. He just couldn't understand. And towards the end of his stay, he really began to go out of his mind, it seems to me, because he was telling everybody that the Soviet government was under the influence of the Vatican. I had a lot of friends there, and uh, their fate, all their cases, were proof for me that the people who landed up in that hospital were those who had done things for which they couldn't be brought to court, who had committed no offence, and the hospital was simply a means of getting rid of them, of putting them out of sight. The hospital regime was similar to any prison regime. An hour's exercise a day, locked cells, outside visitors once a month, uh, one letter a month to relatives, one parcel a month, exactly the same as in a prison. The doctors themselves realized that it was not a hospital, but a prison, and sometimes they said so openly. If a patient uh, misbehaved, he could be punished. How are dissidents treated 
in an insane asylum. It was very easy to get into trouble in that hospital, and the punishments were very severe. There are three kinds of punishment which are most commonly applied there. The first type is carried out by medical means. I think uh, people know about a preparation known as sulfazine, which is used if uh, one of the patients, one of the prisoners in the hospital, committed some offence, um, gave a doctor a rude answer to some question, or declared that a doctor in the hospital was no better than an executioner in a white smock. Such a remark would be sufficient to involve punishment. Sulfazine is a pretty painful form of punishment. It causes your temperature to rise to about 40 degrees uh, centigrade. You feel you have a fever, you can't get out of bed or move about, and it goes on for a day or two. If the treatment is repeated, then the effects can last a whole week or, or even 10 days. A second form of punishment involves the use of the preparation aminozine, used in psychotherapy, also known probably in other countries. It causes the patient to, to feel drowsy, sleepy. He may sleep several days on end, and if the treatment is given regularly, he may go on sleeping f for as long as it uh, is continued. The third form of punishment uh, we used to call, used to call the roll-up. It involved the use of uh, wet canvas long long pieces of it in which the patient is rolled up from head to foot so tightly that it was difficult for him to breathe and as the canvas began to dry out it would get tighter and tighter and make the patient feel even worse but that punishment was applied with some caution there were medical men present while it was taking place who made sure that the patient did not lose consciousness and if his um, pulse began to weaken, then the canvas would be released. Altogether, the medical forms of punishment were pretty widely used, and it was sufficient for a patient to appear cheerful, or on the contrary, miserable, show dissatisfaction or to come any deviation which might appear suspicious to the psychiatrist, to give them grounds for believing that he was ill, that would be sufficient for them to start using those treatments. Well, what is life like for you here now? Are you harassed by the secret police? I was released from the camp in January 1970. But I did not change my opinions, and I did not give up my activity. I continued to do what I was doing before, and therefore it's possible that I shall be arrested any day. I can be arrested at any moment when I meet foreign correspondents, when I'm distributing written material forbidden in the Soviet Union and in other circumstances. It doesn't matter what excuse the authorities find for arresting me. The reason is unimportant for them. There's a saying in the camps, so long as they've got the man, they'll always find the law to fix him. Of course, I know I'm being followed. Uh, my telephone is always tapped. I feel that I'm constantly under observation by the authorities. When I have to do something that I don't want the authorities to know about, uh, I manage to get away from them. But it's pretty difficult in general. I'm unable to get the sort of work I like doing if only because I'm sufficiently well known or because in my identity card there's a mark which tells anyone that I've been in prison. I'm often asked about the prospects for change in this country, what we hope to get from our activity, how many supporters we have. Uh, these are understandable, legitimate questions, but they're very difficult to answer. You have to understand, first of all, what's the essence of our struggle. The essence of it is, in my view, the struggle against fear the fear which has gripped the people since the time of Stalin, which has still not left people, and thanks to which this system continues to exist, a system of uh, dictatorship, of pressure, of oppression. It's into the struggle against fear that we put our greatest effort. And in that struggle, great importance attaches to person example. 
the example which we give people. I personally did what I considered right, spoke out on those occasions when I wanted to, and I'm alive. I'm now sitting here and not in prison. I'm alive. I can get about. I can live. For me and for many people, that's very important. It shows that it's possible to fight and that it is necessary to fight. Bill, we've seen three Russians who willingly put themselves into hazard to make these films. What's apt to happen to them? Harry, I think these three men are in serious trouble. The Soviet state simply does not permit criticism. Of course, the authorities might wait six months, maybe a year. They'll wait till the furor dies down, and these men will be picked up. They'll go back to the mental hospitals or to the concentration camps where they were before. They knew that was going to, it was a possibility when they agreed and urged the interviews. Actually, a couple of times I said, uh, look, let's, let's throw this film away. They said, no, it's regardless of the consequences, we want it shown.